Welcome to this seminar on transgender access to healthcare. Uh, we're so excited that you could all join us. Uh, my name is Susan Hazeldean. I'm a professor at Brooklyn Law School. I direct the LGBT Advocacy Clinic. Um, and the LGBT Advocacy Clinic is sponsoring this program along with the Center for Health Law and Policy. And we are joined by Professor Frank Musquali, who is the faculty director of that program. And we're so excited to welcome you this morning. I wanted to just start by letting you know uh, that this program is being recorded and may be posted on the BLS YouTube channel for educational purposes. Um, so by uh, joining us for this program, you can send uh, uh, to being recorded. Um, I also wanted to let you know that there will be opportunities for audience members to ask questions during the presentation, and you can do so uh, by clicking on the Q&A button and uh, entering your question. And that way, uh, myself and Pre Professor Pasquale, who are moderating the sessions, uh, will have access to your question and can pose it to the panelists. And we really hope that you'll take that chance um, to share your questions and, uh, and any comments you have as the presentation goes along. Um, so, uh, I'm, again, just so excited to welcome everyone here, and I think particularly because we're at such an important moment, um, uh, such a critical moment for uh, the transgender community um, with respect to access to health care um, and, and in many other ways. Um, in 2021 alone, uh, legislatures in 22 states introduce bills to ban uh, access to medically necessary health care for transgender youth. Um, that legislation was adopted in Arkansas, um, again, being considered in 21 other states. Um, it's estimated that about 65,000 young people who are transgender live in those states and could lose access to uh, medically necessary care care that is endorsed by all uh, major medical associations, including the American Medical Association, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, the World Professional Association on Transgender Health and other medical experts as being life-saving, as being care that allows people um, to participate fully in the community and live full lives that reduces uh, the incidence of depression, um, self-harm and suicidal ideation. Um, and yet young people are being denied, potentially uh, deprived of this care. Physicians are potentially facing criminal liability if they continue to provide it. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, we're facing, um, you know, politically motivated attacks. Um, and even outside of the arena of uh, transgender young people and their access to care and whether that will be deprived by state legislation, um, Many transgender adults continue to face significant discrimination in the healthcare system, um, significant barriers accessing the care that they need. And that's why I think it's so important that we're having this panel today so that we can explore some of those vital issues um, and bring light to them and uh, hear from our esteemed experts for joining us today um, about the situation we confront and what can be done um, to address these really serious concerns. So, uh, so glad that you could all join us for this panel. Um, thank you to everyone who uh, is here for the webinar today. Um, and with that, I will turn it over uh, to Professor Frank Pasquale to um, start us with our first panel. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. Um, it is just such an honor to be um, part of this program today. Uh, working with uh, Professor Hazeldean on it and Professor uh, Karen Porter, who's uh, uh, director of our Center for Health, Law, uh, and Science and the Public Interest, um, uh, and with our, our event staff. Um, and it's uh, really an, also a great honor to be uh, having the introduction uh, or to introduce uh, Professor Shaheen Talesh. Um, professor Talesh is an assistant professor at UC Irvine School of Law. He also, and he also has joint appointments in sociology and criminology, law, and society, and is currently the director of the Law and Graduate Studies Program at UCI. Um, Professor Talesh is an interdisciplinary scholar whose work spans law, sociology, and political science, and his research interests include the empirical study of law and business organizations, dispute resolution, consumer protection, and insurance. Um, his work has won multiple awards, and he also has some great experience um, outside of the acad of academia. Uh, prior to working at UC Irvine, Talesh graduated from UCI in 1996 with a degree in criminology, law, and society, 
um, and uh, went to law school at the University of Connecticut and clerked for Justice Norcott of the Connecticut Supreme Court and spent five years working as a business litigation attorney at Foley and Lardner. So I, um, I, I was, uh, I was drawn to uh, Professor Telesh's work by some of his work on cyber uh, liability. And then I also, in my wearing my cap as a, for both a law and technology cap and a health law cap, I, I saw his uh, very interesting work um, with respect to um, uh, health law coverage and particularly um, uh, issues of rights of access to health care for trans people. So with that, without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Professor Telesh's talk. It'll be about 30 minutes, um, and then we'll have some time for uh, discussion. Um, there's the Q&A. Um, we will go till 12.30. We'll then have a break for 10 minutes, and then 12.40 will be our, our second panel. Um, uh, but for now, I will introduce the, the talk, uh, Health Insurance Rights and Access to Care for Trans People, the Social Construction of Medical Necessity. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Susan, Elizabeth, Frank for uh, inviting me to be here. It's a real privilege and thank all of you who are attending. Uh, I wish I could be out there in New York, uh, but of course we have this global pandemic that has turned the world upside down. So, but I'm uh, thrilled to have this opportunity. And I think, um, you know, Susan's remarks, I think were a wonderful uh, warm up to, I think some of the stuff I'm gonna talk about uh, in the next 30 minutes or so. So what I'm gonna do is pause for a moment and make sure I can share my slides. Uh, let me see if this is right. So thumbs up, so people can see my slides. It's sharing, okay? We're okay? Okay, good. All right. Um, so uh, today I'm presenting, um, my remarks are drawn from a paper I'm working on in collaboration with Anna Kirkland and Angela Perone from University of Michigan. Um, we, this project has benefited from funding from the National Science Foundation, um, and we've collected a lot of data on um, sort of how trans people's experiences encountering health insurance coverage, right? And so we have one paper that's been published in Transgender Health that more looks at ins insurance policies, and, and this paper is more about the qualitative experience on the ground. So. Um, you know, I hope you enjoy it. Um, and I think this paper is uh, consistent with my research agenda on law and inequality uh, and law and social change and the role of organizations. Uh, and so this paper is broadly thinking about whether law can produce uh, social change, right? There's been an increased raised rights consciousness and awareness for transgender rights in the past five to 10 years concerning uh, bathroom access, employment, sports, uh, health care, there's been more public discourse, right? And of course, the Affordable Care Act uh, plays a, a big role in this, right? Um, in 2010, you know, the ACA uh, prohibits healthcare entities from discriminating on the basis of race, color, sex, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, um, Section 5 1557 is an important provision of the ACA, it says there's a right to be free from sex discrimination in healthcare. And in fact, under the Obama administration, the regulations that were implemented define sex uh, more broadly than had been done in the past, right? Including an individual's internal sense of gender, which may be male, female, neither, or a combination, right? Um, and in fact, they even had a, a, a banning a categorical exclusion on, on, on limiting uh, services, uh, health services relating to tra uh, gender trans uh, transition. Now, um, Although all of that was put in place, uh, the ACA does allow insurers the discretion to determine what's medically necessary, right? And I have this sort of quote here pulling from that, essentially saying nothing in this section, you know, is intended to determine, restrict a covered entity from determining whether a particular healthcare service is medically necessary or meets applicable coverage requirements, right? Um, and in fact, uh, you know, in 2020, the Trump administration issued new regulations for section 1557 that narrowed the definition of sex to a more traditional biological binary of male and female that human beings share with other mammals, right? That's a quote. Um, drawn from that. And of course, three days after that was done, Bostock v. Clayton County was issued by the Supreme Court, which held that sexual orientation and transgender discrimination are covered by Title VII ban on discrimination on the basis of sex, right? Uh, the idea being, you know, it's impossible to, to discriminate against a transgender gay or lesbian person without taking sex into, the, into account, right? Um, and so this project, I think, sets up a classic law in the books versus law in action situation, right? Um, although the ACA and Bostock 
highlight how law is increasingly embedding rights in legal institutions for transgender persons. It's an open question as to whether these laws can produce the desired social change impact for transgender persons who seek medical coverage through their health insurers. And that's what this paper is essentially exploring, right? Um, we're, exp we're exploring in this project how transgender people and healthcare intermediaries navigate the health insurance process and contest the meaning of medical necessity and coverage determinations, right? And so, you know, our research projects for this empirical project were, were broad, but they're twofold, thinking about sort of how do actors in this field, and we sort of identify the, some of the players in this field here, are they, how are they constructing what medical uh, medically necessary health insurance coverage means on the ground, right? And, and what impact do those constructions have on the delivery of care, okay? So twofold. Now, you know, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the sort of the theoretical background, but I do wanna touch on it a little bit. All this to say is that, you know, existing empirical research on trans people's experiences with health insurance identify a series of individual and structural barriers but haven't focused quite as much on how the construction and implementation of medical necessity among healthcare actors impacts trans people's access to care, right? Um, and in fact, sociolegal health scholars have, have highlighted you know, patient and provider contestation of insurance coverage, uh, and to some degree, the role of medical necessity. And the paper kind of you know, tries to do a literature review of this. Um, and, uh, and so, they haven't looked at necessarily how these issues are resolved in the transgender health context. And so we integrate and extend these literatures by exploring the processes and mechanisms through which trans people, doctors, administrators, and insurers, or allies or not allies, um, construct the meaning of medical necessity and then looking at the impact. And in, and in doing so, um, you know, we fill in some, some gaps, we feel like. So there are some bigger debates going on here, which is whether, you know, insurance or insurance institutions can act as regulators. There's a big literature in this. I write in this space. Um, and we're really exploring to what extent uh, does policy language implementation and interpretation or, get, or insurers playing a gatekeeping function to transgender persons' access to care. Uh, we're focusing in a deep dive into trans people's experiences in the health insurance context, and all the while thinking about, you know, how actors are mobilizing uh, their rights in these spaces. So that's kind of the context for the project and the theoretical engagement um, of what we're trying to do here. Uh, and then, uh, you know, as I said, this is an empirical project. I forgot to mention this paper actually is about to uh, be published in Law and Society Review. Uh, it's been accepted after a long peer review process. Um, it should be coming out in the next couple of months. Um, so, you know, it's fairly, it's been, it's had the benefit of uh, a lot of, you know, great peer review uh, feedback, if you will, as we've have gone forward. I forgot to mention that at the outset in case people are wondering, you know, if they wanted to sort of see where this goes. Um, in terms of methods, getting back on track here, in terms of methods, um, as I said, we, we collected insurance policies. It's more so in our other paper, but it does we do touch on it in this paper. And in fact, we use some of our grant to actually purchase uh, access to health insurance contracts. Uh, we purchased access to about 1,500 health insurance contracts, and we analyzed and coded the summary plan documents, which were each about 120, 100 to 200 pages, right? Um, we did a deep dive analysis more into California and Michigan, which both of which, um, you know, exclude some explicit legal protections for transgender health, uh, but both Michigan and, and California ban insurance exclusions for transgender health, so they're not supposed to do that, but California also even goes farther to provide transgender inclusive health benefits for state employees, so we're trying to pick cases where um, you know, there was a little bit of variation, but also some, some similarity. And then we coded um, these in health insurance uh, documents across a series of categories. We, we coded for the types of exclusions that were specific to trans health that we located. We coded for the existence of non-discrimination clause in the contract and whether gender identity or sexual orientation were included. And we coded for the absence or presence of the World Professional Association of Transgender Health recommendations for transgender health benefits across 52 categories, if you will. So WPATH, you know, it's an international organization body that brings together experts, doctors, and, 
you know, uh, it, it doesn't, it has a certain, there's a certain consensus building that takes place among WPATH with regard to transgender health and recommendations for best practices. So we wanted to see to what extent are these factors being incorporated into these health insurance contracts and policies. We coupled that with interviews, in-depth interviews, 60 to 90 minutes, uh, you know, uh, you know, recorded and transcribed, right, uh, with transgender and non-binary adults who had recent encounters uh, with using their health insurance coverage. Uh, and then we also interviewed, um, you know, what we can just think of broadly as intermediaries or allies, uh, surgeons, clinical workers, office administrators who work with transgender and non-binary patients, right. So our, our pool was essentially, you know, uh, individuals who identify with regard to to the patient's experience with individuals who identify as transgender or non-binary non -binary, who are over 18 who sought health insurance coverage um, who sought care since the summer of 2017 and who were willing to talk about their experiences and we you know we followed the standard procedures and protocols for social science research we we had uh, we employed some graduate students, uh, and a couple of undergraduates with respect to coding of the health insurance policies. We did intercoder reliability. So we, we went through a system of, of sort of practice coding to make sure that the, the coders were coding in a similar way, right? So you're gonna code so many documents and so much uh, information, you wanna have some level of reliability. We, we sort of followed the standard procedures for doing that. Uh, we, uh, analyze the interview transcripts through Atlas TI, which allowed us to see similarities and, and better systematize our research to see that are we finding things that are consistent? Are we seeing things repetitively stated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and again, I'm happy to take more questions on the methods um, uh, during the conversation or the Q&A session. So with regard to the uh, um, insurance policy or contract language, uh, briefly, um, in some, Although our health insurance policies reveal that although outright exclusions are far less pervasive, uh, insurance policy language remains confusing and difficult to understand, empowering insurers to sometimes cloak coverage decisions and make it hard for enrollees to know what their entitlements and rights are, right? So, you know, in fact, what's interesting is, you know, uh, 54 of the uh, almost 1,500 policies still contain categorical exclusions, even though they're, they're not supposed to do that in these states, um, um, which was interesting. So you can say so still 3%, approximately 3% contain exclusions. So there's different ways to look at that. On the one hand, you could say, well, at least 97% aren't doing so, but of course, it's still 3%, which is interesting. More often, though, uh, health uh, insurance companies announce that they cover trans-related care, but they exclude, exclude specific procedures. Uh, that would allow the trans patient to receive meaningful care and often go against uh, WPATH um, guidelines, okay? Um, and often there were mixed messages that were, we found uh, with respect to the health insurance policies. Often it was confusing or difficult to understand these policies. They were often silent. The policies were often silent as to confirming affirmation of trans coverage, <clears throat> but they had, of course, non-trans specific exclusions based on gender identity, right? We had almost a third of the policies that were silent as to transgender coverage, um, which was interesting. Uh, and that was through, again, massive thousands of pages of documents going through. One example here, you know, Ca California Kaiser plans don't mention gender dysphoria coverage, but they note in a section about travel expenses that reimbursement would be covered for specialty services such as transgender. So you know, there isn't an affirmation of coverage necessarily, but then of course you see that there is some reference to coverage there. Sutter, another a big provider in California, particularly Northern uh, California plans, they mentioned that penile prosthesis would not be covered except for transgender related care. But they, again, they lack a, a section affirming transgender care more broadly or generally. So, so you know, uh, improvement, but still uh, not a perfect world, right? Um, and then the paper and, and the rest of this talk, I think will pivot more toward the qualitative uh, research that we uncovered here. Um, and really the, the, I wanna, I'm gonna, my remarks are shaped around sort of four big arguments uh, about what we saw, which was contestation over medical necessity and how that sh shapes trans people's experience to healthcare. One, one big finding was that the meaning of medical necessity is very socially constructed by the actors who seek and work in this space. And it leads to two def different definitions essentially operating in the field. And I'll talk about that in a moment. 
Two, um, insurers use discretion. As I said, there's discretion in how they operationalize medical necessity. Um, they use the discretion afforded to them in insurance policies with respect to the term medical necessity to impose rules and restrictions that throw up barriers for transgender people. So um, although there's a lot of discretion in how medical necessity is, is framed, they put in a series of rules and requirements that make it hard uh, for transgender people to access meaningful care. Uh, three, uh, healthcare providers, doctors, social workers rely on billing and coding processes, mental health referral letters and appeals as key moments to contest the meaning of medical necessity, the determination of medical necessity. And in doing so, they engage in meaning making activities as to what these terms mean. And finally, you know, transgender people are not um, you know, they are very um, active in, in, in engaging in individual uh, and structural responses to contesting these denials. There's agency here among, among the patients, if you will, who are experiencing these barriers, and I'll talk about that. Um, so first, um, the social construction of medical necessity. There's sort of two perspectives here, right? And it's a battleground term, right? Medical necessity, right? If a coverage, it's covered if it's medically necessary, it's not covered, it's excluded if an insurer determines a procedure is cosmetic, experimental, or investigational, right? And so there are two views that sort of emerge uh, in the field based on what, based on our sort of uh, inquiry, if you will. One is the insurer view, which is that, look, a medical procedure is medically necessary if there's a physical functional benefit, right? We need to see an improved physical function. Uh, um, you heard that kind of over and over. That was the perspective that was articulated. And the second view is more sort of the doctor, the therapist, the ally view, which is that medical necessity is whether the procedure improves the well being and quality of life for the person, including improving the mental health of the person. And the context from which the procedure is being sought really matters. Okay, so, so two different views that sort of a narrow and a, and, a, and a broad view create a contestation in the field. And so, you know, here's a, a nice perspective from one doctor. Uh, uh, we changed the names, right, to anonymize the names of the doctors. We put in pseudonyms here. Um, but, but here's a, a nice quote, I think, that highlights some of this. The distinction for me between a cisgender and a transgender woman is the medical condition. I would argue it's no particular procedure that's inherently cosmetic or reconstructed. It's the diagnosis for which the procedure is being performed. Insurance companies have simply chosen to view the issue of gender dysphoria as cosmetic. Right? And so this functional view that the insurers have leads to inequities because these patients um, have unique needs, right? Um, facial confirmation procedure or breast reduction is not elective or cosmetic, but vital to their mental and physical security and to decreasing the chance of discrimination, stigma, and violence, right? And as Susan mentioned, you know, these are some things that are very much in play uh, in the transgender community. Uh, including a higher suicide rate than sort of the average population, which is a very real issue that came up over and over in our interviews with uh, transgender uh, persons who had invoked their health insurance coverage, right? Another nice example of this narrow construction of medical necessity and how it creates barriers is this issue of laser hair removal, okay? So surgeons often require laser hair removal from the genital area before transition, gender transition surgeries, uh, so that the final result doesn't leave hair growing in undesirable pace, uh, places. Um, now, insurers do not cover laser hair removal as, and they deem it, and the reason they don't cover it is not medically necessary, okay? So here's one clinical social worker's take on this, right? Hair removal, this is huge. General surgeries are often, are often covered, but what's not covered or treated as medically necessary is hair removal at the surgical site. So that's like bonkers, like straight up. It's part of a medically necessary surgery, but I can't think of any insurance companies right now that are covering it. Our plastic surgeons write a lot of letters saying it's part of a necess medically necessary surgery. You guys need to cover this, right? And so this is a nice example of the sort of the tension, the different constructions, right? Um, of how actors in the field who are dealing with these issues on a day and day are thinking about medical necessity in really different ways. And it leads to transgender um, access being hindered or limited or challenging, right, barriers, right? Um, and in fact, you know, transgender persons that we talk to express frustration about the ambiguous definition of medical necessity. They want clearer, broader definitions, and they want, most importantly, I think, to change the discourse and language around medical necessity. And this, I know this is a long quote, but bear with me, because I think it, it really highlights this. This is one of the 
the transgender persons who, uh, patients and persons who we, we encountered, uh, we interviewed, uh, and, and this person's take on this. I think one thing that definitely needs to change, and I think that you can tell it's starting to, is how we think about gender affirming procedures and surgeries or hormone replacement therapy and how insurance companies see these particular things are affecting individuals. So like looking at things as medically necessary, that's super important because that changes how it's written in the policy and how it's talked about. Because I think what the problem is now is a lot of the healthcare that trans folks are seeking is trivialized and thought of as like, you know, some sort of quote unquote cosmetic, which is a way for them to say not necessary. And so if you change the language about it, you change how it's talked about and recognize how these, you know, these things are medically necessary and affect the lives, right? And it goes on, okay? So this really gets to the heart of kind of what this paper is about and what we're trying to bring to light and bring to the conversation for today's uh, conference and, and conversation. Um, so there's a big category, right? So I wanna talk about a second category here. So as I said, insurers have discretion, okay? With regard to how they construct what's medically necessary and how they mobilize this again. This was interesting. This is something I don't think we, I think going into the project really anticipated was gonna be such a big part of it, which was that um, insurers create rule and rigid rule-based requirements that make qualifying for medical ne medically necessary treatment uh, much harder. So there's discretion, but the discretion is mobilized in the form of tight rules, which throw up barriers for transgender people, right? Um, often um, insurers are not following the WPATH guidelines and recommendations and often require more, okay? Additional documentation for procedures. So for example, requiring two mental health letters for a patient to seek such gender transition care as opposed to the one which is recommended by WPATH, right? So, you know, sometimes that criteria doesn't necessarily align with the WPATH. The insurance criteria for surgery, they model it by the WPATH, but they don't actually follow it. I recently had a patient for chest reconstruction. The WPATH criteria says they need one letter of referral from a mental health specialist. I've had two blue crosses say we need actually two letters. We've tried fighting that that's not medically necessary, okay? Now, what we found also was interesting, a layer on top of this is that often patients do what's called in the socio-legal literature, lump it. In other words, rather than kind of fight it, they just sort of, you know, choose to go through the, the additional hoop. They lump their losses. In other words, they don't sort of contest or fight the claim or fight the in inequity. Uh, they just sort of accept that they need to get two letters and, and do it uh, rather than fight and try to change the process, which is understandable given the, the situation. But, but um, this shows you that these barriers are real and it forces uh, patients to have to take on extra challenges. Another issue that came up, of course, is the age limit, right? Often 18, some states even 21. Uh, WPATH recommends 18, but they say discretion to, there needs to be taken into account discretion to account for the individual needs of the person. So you know, here's a take from a psychologist that we interviewed on this, who was really fired up about this, this arbitrary distinction you know, our surgeons get this and we get this. They, they, they went to do a pre-authorization with the insurance company and the insurance company denied it. When I talked to the person at the insurance company, they said, there's no research evidence to show that it is helpful. Okay, so just correct me if I'm wrong. We know that the suicide rate, the suicide attempt rate, not suicidal ideation, but completed suicide, but the rate of actual people who commit suicide is 41% of transgender people. Uh, this person's 17, they're not 18. Do we really think they have a lower suicide rate because they're 17 and not 18? I don't think so. Here's the insurance company. They're supposed to be helping their members get services they need so that they're healthy. I think that's a ruse. I think it's a cover. I think they'll do anything to try not to pay, right? So again, this is the kind of on the ground lived experience of the players in the field here that's going on. Other um, rules, I mean, these were some of the big ones, right? Age transition limit, uh, you know, age limit, uh, number of letters. Those are some big ones, but um, other um, barriers where we encountered you know, at a level of sort of inadequate and incompetent staff that often created intersectional issues along race and class, um, long mandatory waiting periods and verifications for procedures or what we try to term as sort of worthiness clauses. So you have to wait a certain period to get this transition longer than what's recommended, uh, like a year or 18 months and sort of kind of like, see, are you really, do you really want this care? You know, are you so worthy that you really need this care? Um, and they throw these barriers up. That was the experience um, reflected in the interviews. Um, uh, financial costs of procedures, because insurers often pay for a portion of the care was another barrier. And this was an interesting one on the bottom here that, I, again, we didn't, I didn't anticipate this. We didn't anticipate this one as much as it 
came out in the interviews, which is a lack of available doctors and mental health professionals in geographic areas made it hard for patients to receive care. So um, geography plays a role here. Um, and parents or, or patient, transgender persons had to often drive uh, four or six hours to get to a uh, uh, someone who could write a mental health letter. Um, and that's, that's a barrier. Um, driving four to six hours is, you know, is, is a significant. Um, so, so that's, a, you know, a kind of a big category of what we talk about in the paper. Now, um, I want to briefly, I want to talk about patient mobilization because it is definitely in play. Uh, you know, transgender non-binary persons are mobilizing, right? They're not just sitting idle here. They mobilize in different ways, both individual, structural, and I, we say intermediate approaches, right? Uh, individual mobilization was in the form of, okay, we have these challenges, um, as I've articulated, Okay, well, you know, obtaining much additional jobs, uh, maintaining multiple jobs simultaneously, switching jobs, taking on credit card debt, switching insurance plans, moving to a new job um, in a different state, and sometimes even, you know, stockpiling hormones after encountering challenges with coverage. So, you know, cr you know make sure you have a supply just in the event that the health insurer might, you know, change its tune, if you will. Um, that's coupled with structural uh, mobilization that took place. There was some of this, not always, but there are those that are engaged in the larger structural fight, right? Fighting with the insurance company is a mode of activism and contesting coverage and pushing the insurance company to clarify its documents and its language. Um, there was some of that. And in fact, sometimes um, individuals are working with nonprofits seeking uh, to expand coverage and policy length, right? There's a, there's a larger mobilization story that is taking place in our society. And, and we, we we're able to touch on that. So there is some structural mobilization. Um, and there's also intermediate approaches, I think. Uh, you know, information exchange and interpersonal mobilization among transgender persons online, social networking, social media, social circles, to, to communicate information about where one could get a mental health letter um, and information about health insurance companies. So there is a sort of an intermediate, uh, very ground, low level, uh, communication community and, and made much more prevalent, I think, through, you know, social media avenues that you can talk to people, um, you know, somebody in Vermont can talk to somebody in California in a way that maybe 40, 50 years ago, you, you couldn't, uh, they wouldn't know to who to talk to. And so that, that does occur too. And we thought that interesting to, to bring to light in the paper. Um, finally, the fourth sort of category, if you will, uh, we evaluated in this space about the construction, the social construction of medical necessity is the contestations over medical necessity and how they shape the disputing process in general. Here's more of a focus, um, you know, less on transgender persons and more on the doctors, the clinicians, the counselors, the administrators that we spoke with um, and the different ways that they mobilize and, and, and therefore contest the meaning of medical necessity. One is in the form of creative coding. Okay, coding of what procedures are going to take place as a pathway to medical necessity, but of course, being careful not to violate ethical and legal rules that doctors have, right? So here's a nice quote. I mean, we have a few in the paper, but this one I think gives you a sense, a good, nice flavor, I think. Um, so it becomes one of those things where it's a lot of gray zone. Uh, this is a doctor talking. On the one hand, uh, you have to advocate for your patient and you want to try to help them to the maximum extent, achieve coverage for the surgery that's appropriate for them. On the other hand, you can't lie and defraud the insurance companies. And so, like I said, our team's pretty good. Our team may err on the sort of overly strict kind of, you know, totalitarian side of things, but it's an issue. The coding is very imprecise. And so there's, the, you know, the doctors are very mindful of how they code um, care in, in ways to hopefully trigger medical necessity and there's a game that's being played here and it has to be done in a very delicate way because right you can't violate your ethical and legal duties right um but this came out uh in in the discussions um another category a couple of categories here were were the encountering of careful letter writing for documenting gender dysphoria as a pathway for uh, a transgender person to uh achieve uh, medical necessity, medically necessary care, right? And there's also even an informal network that has developed among social workers and therapists. That's sort of an informal training, if you will, on how to sort of navigate these hoops, right? And here's a, a social worker's comment on that. I know what the insurance companies want to hear and need to hear, and I write what they want to hear and need to hear. 
So what do they need to hear is the question we ask. That, that the, and then the answer is that the patient checks those boxes, if you will. And I give them as little information as possible, but I don't want them to sort of glom onto anything that I said to use it to deny care. And this is how I teach other people to write letters as well. Like, let's keep it short and simple, basic, just outline that they meet the criteria and keep it moving. Okay? And we heard this you know, multiple times and uh, different people. Uh, but I like this quote because it, it kind of gets right to what we're talking about here, which is sort of being very careful uh, that the documentation process is very, um, uh, there's a lot of thought and reflection because they know what's at stake here, right? And what's at stake is some of the things we outlined earlier and even in Susan's opening remarks about you know, the impact of denials of care uh, on this community. Um, lastly, you know, uh, here doctors we experience play a, a, what we call sort of a quasi lawyer role on appeals letters. And, and you know, I put here in the parentheses the legalization of medicine. This is the literature that exists, you know, the idea of sort of how legal constructs import into how medicine gets deployed. So, you know, I, I don't want to take credit for, for terms that have been, you know, invoked by prior scholars, but just to note that what we found on the ground was, you know, lawyer, uh, doctors in these appeals letters are often mobilizing, you know, very, they're, they're acting like quasi lawyers. They're using the terms, the, the terms they need to in crafting the letters to, uh, on these appeals to try to uh, communicate um, an expectation that the carrier will understand that this is medically necessary coverage. And so, uh, the paper outlines some quotes uh, of lawyers and, and uh, of doctors using very sort of law-like language. And so you see this infusion uh, of law into the practice of medicine, right? And I think, you know, uh, there's been many who have written on this larger construct. And I think it's a really fascinating area. It's one I, I wish I had more time to, to dig into, but, but it was in play here. Um, so, uh, you know, in summary, you know, this is sort of the final slide here. Um, you know, the implications here are, look, although formal law is improving for transgender persons, right, which was where I started, let's say, with Bostock and the ACA, um, intermediaries, right, impact law's capacity to produce social change on the ground, right? This is the area I write in. Uh, there's lots of formal laws, laws impact organizations and individuals, but there are a lot of intermediaries who play a role in how law is implemented, interpreted, and constructed, right? And in this case, insurance companies, doctors, uh, social workers, the, the, the transgender community, non-binary patient community, they play a role in whether law's capacity will produce that social change on the ground to the people, okay? And there are barriers that develop for trans and non-binary patients, including policy language, silences in the policy, interpretive disagreements, and contested expertise, right? And doctors, therapists, administrators are acting as sort of agents of resistance here in this space, but trans patients also are mobilizing. Right, uh, they're not sitting idle, uh, and they're mediating multiple and interlocking institutional barriers. Right, I mentioned intersectionality, I mentioned geography, I mentioned law, legal, and medical. Right, there's multiple things going on here, um, and and the paper tries to you know is blending them in some sense because it's it's a complex issue. But but now extracting out of the paper is that there are multiple mediating barriers here that are going. Um, some thoughts on recommendations, sometimes people ask, you know, I think there's a sense that, you know, that our sense from talking to people is that the WPATH seems to be, um, you know, their recommendations seem to be very, fairly well regarded, not perfect, but, and there's a sense that from people in the field that, you know, look, it would be better if insurers followed the WPATH guidelines, okay, uh, and stuck to that better. Um, and that there needs to be sort of, of course, greater transparency for all health insurance plans sold without differential treatment, based on, let's say, an ERISA pre pre preemption, excuse me. Um, and then, you know, we need more knowledge and transparency on how insurance denial appeals process work as a site of civil justice, right? As a site where, you know, we often think in the legal academy, especially that, uh, you know, we think of legal problems as in the court system or maybe arbitration, but there's you know, people encounter legal problems in these spaces, in healthcare disputes, in employment disputes, in insurance disputes. And these are two, three steps removed from the formal courthouse, right? Uh, and, and this is a site of civil justice. And so we need to really dive into how these, these quasi courts uh, or appeals processes operate because they impact the lived experience of people, right? So 
Um, that's essentially my talk and, you know, uh, the paper, as I said, it's coming out in Law Society Review, uh, should be in a couple months. So, you know, if people are interested, uh, take a look and I'm happy to take questions. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Shaheen. This was just absolutely fantastic. Um, I thought that this was a, a real tour de force uh, paper, both in terms of showing the relevance of social science to lawyers and how important it is that we as attorneys and particularly as in the legal academy, like develop a much better understanding of the interactions on the ground here. And I, I, I if, and just as moderator, I'm going to just take the indulgence of, of making a few comments on how I see this as, as both uh, incredibly important to our workshop, our theory practice workshop specific point of transgender health law and policy, and also um, how it is generative of so many uh, interesting and important angles of further research. Uh, so the first thing that I, I, you know, in thinking about this is when I heard you talk about driving four to six hours um, or, or people that whom you interviewed, um, uh, the patients needing to drive five, four to six hours in order to either get the relevant uh, mental health care or other aspects of referrals. Um, I, I think about network adequacy regulation, right? I mean, they're supposed to be under the ACA, I think both the Department of Labor and um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, and, and of course state, law, state insurance regulars are, are expected to be thinking about how are these insurers um, dealing with network adequacy. And to me, when we're talking about four or six hour drives, that is not an adequate network. That is just not something that is, uh, and, and the, the tragedy though is at one point, I remember 10 years ago teaching that sort of stuff and saying, well, um, it would take, uh, given the staffing uh, uh, in the federal level, it would take them 300 years to, um, uh, take a, to uh, inspect every individual plan. Right. So, you know, so, so if we're thinking about, you know, ERISA plans or Department of Labor, et cetera, it's like, it's just, we are so far removed from anything close to a relevant um, uh, 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 sort of the, the staffing levels necessary in order to uh, run such a complex uh, healthcare system or non-system as, as many health scholars call it, call, scholars call it. Also, uh, when you mentioned the doctors giving in the letters as little information as possible in the letter. This is just, it struck such a chord with me because I was involved in some discussions with HHS about the information demands that are being made by insurers with respect to prior authorization. Mm -hmm. And what a lot of insurers are saying is to the doctors is that they're saying, well, we would like to make prior authorization much more efficient and even allow some automation of prior authorization procedures. But in exchange, we want to have full access to the patient's entire medical record. Oh, wow. Which, you know, is, is, is quite troubling because the thing about that is that, you know, we have minimum necessary rules for a reason, right? We have minimum necessary transfers of health data rules for a reason, which is that, you know, these are very sensitive topics. And we have heard about several health data breaches throughout the healthcare system, including some very severe ones in insurers. And, you know, the, the, and, and what really worries me is that, you know, we, we see already um, the tension between the model of the insurer as some sort of having fiduciary obligation versus the model of the insurer, which you've discussed, which is the insurer as doing as anything not to pay, right? And that to me is, is, is more accurate. The latter is more accurate. Uh, uh, and that there is just such um, remarkable, uh, and, and I've just, what I'm also remar find remarkable is every year that I teach health law, I hear more horror stories among students, among people I talk about, about completely arbitrary and uh, troubling insurance regulations, you know, getting in the way of care. And the insurer, rather than being anything like a fiduciary advancing the care and welfare of the person that they're ostensibly looking out for, rather just being a, a total a barrier to care. And my final uh, uh, point that I would make is I, I see we've got some questions now and I, I don't wanna filibuster the, any of the questions, but I, I'd note that, you know, these. I think this is so interesting in thinking about independent review organizations as applied as as provided for in the in the Accountable Care Act, and you know I, I will uh, defer a question on that topic for later. But well, the one you know perhaps small promise of rationality or compassion in this overall arching non-system uh, sort of Kafkaesque uh, system uh, might be uh, independent review. But you know I I, I just wanted to, to raise that as a possibility. Um, so yeah, I mean, and maybe that, and, and uh, so so next up, I, I guess I just wanted to be sure to to uh, uh, invite Alejandro. May I react so, briefly? Yeah. Oh yeah, please do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so on the first point, the four to six hour, this came up especially uh, in like rural contexts. So you know, 
and, and there's a sort of assumption, oh yeah, you know, people who live in rural areas might, you know, need gender transition surgeries. And so like you, those patients, those people we talk to, especially sort of this rural urban, you know, if you live in a rural area, it's really hard, right? And it becomes very hard uh, because you're not, you don't have as much access to healthcare, you know, like Los Angeles, there's, you know, tons of healthcare places to go to, you know, it's so, so there's this also this geography, very nuanced sense of geography there. So I just wanted to, you know, add that point. Um, and I think to your larger comments, I think points sort of two, three, and four, they get at really the heart of the project, which is to kind of get on the ground and bring to surface the subtle ways that barriers are constructed in this amidst a world where we think things are getting better with greater sort of formal law protections, let's say through the ACA and through court cases, et cetera, there's these subtle barriers that create really tough hoops for people on the ground. And so kind of getting at that really granular level. Um, and I think, I think your comments all hit to that, right? I mean, like, like that's exactly what we're trying to do. It's sort of very subtle. Oh, there's medical necessity. You got discretion, but then there's all these rules that you got to jump through, which make it really hard to get that care, right? And so they ban categorical exclusions. You say, great. Oh, but uh, and there's all these other subtle hoops that make it really hard. So, and I think on the independent review, I mean, I would love to study that if I could get access. You know, if you get access and we should partner up, I mean, we do a, an observational study of how how these disputes, you know, the, the language used in the hearings and, and sort of, the responses and how um, how these things get resolved on the ground would be a wonderful, I think, contribution to the literature. So thank you for those comments, by the way. Great, great. Um, and, and Alejandra, yeah. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, I can also just react to the independent review thing just pretty quickly. Um, uh, I actually went through this process myself um, and I can cover it a little bit in my part of my presentation, but um, it, there's like external appeals done by the Department of Financial Services here in the state of New York. Um, and one of the things that uh, became uh, partially an issue is that many of the independent reviewers, uh, because there's no real um, like full certification for any kind of gender affirming surgeries, all they need is a, a, a certification in any kind of uh, plastic surgery. And so oftentimes it's, it's hand surgeons with literally no experience in treating people with gender dysphoria. Um, who then deny surgeries um, using extremely outdated uh, medical literature um, and even sometimes using offensive language in their, their letters. And that, that's what happened to me a few years ago um, when I did an external appeal to the Department of Financial Services. And this is a real issue, um, mainly because um, you know, a lot of these insurers rely on, on reviewers who are usually older have been semi-retired or retired from daily practice of medicine and are in their 70s and 80s. And so um, that, that ends up being a, a quite a, a barrier because they're, they're not really up to date on, on you know, all the, the modern treatments of, of uh, gender affirming surgery. And I'll add just as a, a broader point to um, Professor Telesh as, as uh, like some of the uh, uh, barriers uh, of, to care is a lot of the doctor's offices, um, the people handling the insurance there oftentimes don't have any idea of how to actually go about challenging these exclusions or getting the care um, covered. They oftentimes either rely on like the first thing that works and over rely on it and don't realize that there's all, all these kinds of complexities. I have been told multiple times that if I got denied you know, at Mount Sinai or NYU, I could just do a fair hearing, which doesn't apply to me because I have private insurance and a fair hearing only applies to people with Medicaid. Um, and then I was told, well, why don't you get on a Medicare? Cause they readily cover this. And it's like, again, I, I'm not eligible for Medicaid. Um, I have private insurance. And then um, several times, um, you know, they, they just are, aren't aware at, at any point, like how to actually challenge or, or even do administrative appeals. And I had to explain to them multiple times, I'm an attorney that had specialized in this um, you know, just to be able to get them on the same page. Um, and I think one just the kind of last point is that um, some of these denials or some of the barriers specifically around time uh, requirements uh -huh. um, or letters of medical necessity um, and prior authorizations in particular, one of the kind of heinous practice I think of insurance companies is what they do is 
Um, and I think partially some of this is on the fault of the, of the uh, surgeon's offices that wait too long to, to send prior authorizations in. So the insurer will then call up about a week before, sometimes even three or four days uh, before surgery and say like, oh, actually we're not gonna approve this because we need another letter of medical necessity or you were supposed to have seen this doctor for a year rather than six months. And so we're gonna deny it. And you know the person may scramble to get a, another right. letter of medical necessity, but it might be near impossible. And then all of a sudden the surgery is canceled and given the kind of lack of providers, some of these surgeries are scheduled sometimes a year in advance. And so um, it can take six months to a year to reschedule. This recently happened um, to me um, in, in September. I had a surgery scheduled in September and uh, the insurance company kind of sat on its hands and waited until about two, two weeks before the surgery to finally deny it. And then by that point, it was too late to do any kind of appeals. Um, and the next surgery date is in March. So, yeah. you know, this is kind of a, a systemic problem on both ends. Um, and it's, you know, and then just some, and part of the exclusions, um, you know, they'll say we cover all medically necessary care, but then presumptively exclude all kinds of care as cosmetic. And that's you know, yeah. another issue. Yeah, you know, if I can jump in on, these are fantastic comments. And, uh, you know, on the first point you made about often the, the doctors or the people reviewing these things are sort of older and antiquated in, in, in the knowledge. That was something that came up among the doctors we spoke with who do uh, on these appeals, they often do what's called a peer-to-peer -peer review where they'll get on the phone with the medical administrator who's a doctor. And they said, look, within the first two minutes, I know how it's gonna go. If I'm talking to a peer-to-peer -peer doctor who really knows this area, we have a great conversation and you know, it goes well. But often, you know, it's not that doctor, it's a different doctor who has no idea what's going on and it's just a horrible peer-to-peer -peer process. So, so that just, it just confirms what you're, our research confirming what you were talking about, which is really depends on who's on the other line who's on, the, on, the, on that phone, right? Um, and oftentimes they were saying, you know, within the first two minutes, we'll know <laughs> how, how, they're talking, how they're talking about this. Do they get it or do they not? Um, and then the second point you made is a great point too, which is it's hard to navigate the health insurance system. You need a, you need a, a mental health letter. You need to do this. There's a waiting period for that. You need this surgery. You need this procedure, right? And it can be really hard to navigate um, and one thing that we did see as an area of promise, we didn't have enough to really include it in the paper because it was a sort of one example, but they, they do exist across the country. But I believe uh, UC, UCSF Hospital has what's called a gender transition patient navigator. And what the patient navigator does is essentially help the patient navigate the health insurance process. And because you might need to go to urology, you might need to go to this department. And you know, it's very hard. I mean, I have trouble navigating the health insurance process, let alone somebody who, who could be, you know, in a, in a different sort of position. And the navigator is the one who navigates you. And I thought that was a, a really, um, I think UCSF is doing some really, you know, uh, progressive things with regard to care in this space. Um, but this idea of a navigator, I think is really interesting. And I try to get a sense of, you know, I try to make it more part of the project. We tried to, but we sort of we didn't have enough people to talk to. We didn't have enough to go on. But I mean, it's something that I think hits at addressing some of that challenge is if there was a navigator in the health insurance process that could help the patient navigate through the maze that health insurance is, uh, it would help reduce, not eliminate some of these barriers. So um, yeah, I thought uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to intervene that point on your point. You're muted, you're muted. And just even a quick follow up to that, um, you know, I think it, it stems from a broader issue of even when there are programs specific to trans people, um, they're often not given priority or um, not funded as well as other departments. I think uh, Mount Sinai Center for Transgender Medicine actually started their legal clinic um, in conjunction when I, uh, with NILAG when I worked at New York Legal Assistance Group. And, um, you know, I, I recently uh, was there in March and, you know, like mm -hmm. it's the smallest office. And like when I would go to that same office in Union Square for, for other doctor's appointments, there's like really nice with TVs and like all of this stuff. And then you go to the, the trans department and it's like small, super, super small office. And there was like 20 people crammed in there. Give, you know, keep in mind, this was still during peak pandemic times. Right. And like, 
there, there's just absolutely no priority given it's underfunded, the staff are overworked, and um, you know, the, the, it's a serious problem with, with hospitals still not putting priority for trans patients. Yeah, this is really, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, really exposing a lot of, of deep, deep problems today, and, and, and thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, and Susan, did you have a, a question? Or, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry to, uh, I didn't want to, want to yes, call yes, you. Yes, no, sorry, I thank you. I appreciate well. the opportunity. Um, yeah. yeah, so thank you so much for this presentation. I think this is, um, you know, fascinating in, in and uh, really, uh, I guess, um, I think so helpful that you're documenting so many things that, you know, um, just in my limited experience as a practitioner trying to represent people in appeals on these issues, which I'm definitely seeing. So thank you so much for that. Um, I guess I, I wanted to just follow up on your point about the legalization of medicine or the way that these denials are kind of transforming or forcing, I guess, doctors to become advocates for their patients and basically um, you know, uh, try to represent their interests before the insurance company or try to, you know, present them as, as best they can. Um, and I guess I, I just wonder, do you, do you think that's an overall kind of a, a positive thing, a negative thing that doctors are taking on that role? What, what's your view on, on uh, you know? It's, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, and it's sort of like, uh, to me, it's, it's the reality thing, right? I mean, the reality is that, you know, with, I mean, this goes back to, I think the change to pivot to managed care many, many years ago and, you know, uh, cost containment and the challenges to the delivery of care where, um, you know, doctors used to be very aligned with the patients and sort of a fee for service model. And then, you know, all these um, restrictions on how they deliver care came up. And so I think doctors, I think over time have become much more aware of law. I think, I mean, as I was saying, the legalization of medicine idea is a larger thing that's been studied and they're much more aware about defensive medicine, medical malpractice, uh, you know, talking to doctors about laws. Is, I think now in 2020 is a different experience than in, you know, the 1960s. Um, and so I think this is just the next step that, that they've taken all this knowledge and awareness of coverage and denials and pre-authorization. And of course, in the shadow of all that is medical malpractice, et cetera. And they're, they're, they know the game. And so it's the reality is that if they're going to advocate for their patient, they have to use the terms, they got to use the language, they have to operationalize their letter in a way that's going to trigger coverage. And so, you know, that's, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's net positive in the sense that they're advocating for their patients, but I think it's really interesting because I think when they go to med school, I don't think they know that that's what they're going to be doing you know, is on a, a 2 p.m. on a day sitting down at a computer and writing a law-like letter trying to advocate kit for coverage. I don't think that's what they thought when they went to med school. So that's kind of how I would address that. I saw a question in the chat about uh, the paper and when it's gonna be available. We've paid for open access. So when the paper is published, it, it's, you're not gonna have to go through firewalls to access the paper. So, you know, if you just take the title of the page, I mean, I'll, I'll send it to Frank when it's published. And I don't know if there's a pathway for you to communicate, but you know, if you just put my name and the title of the paper, health insurance rights and access to healthcare for trans people, the social construction of medical necessity or something like that, uh, Google search, you should be able to pretty easily because we paid for open access so that people won't have barriers and go through all these paywalls to, to access the article. So hopefully in the next couple of months, it'll be out. Excellent. That is really good news. Um, and yeah, and I just wanted to note as well that uh, in terms of the recording, um, uh, anyone who's, who's interested in you know, listening today, um, just be aware that it'll be, um, uh, check the Brooklyn Law School YouTube channel on the homepage of our website in about two weeks. So in about two weeks, we'll have that up uh, because I do think this has um, been a really, really instructive look. Uh, and I think it could be, you know, it could become easily an authoritative look on um, these issues. Um, and uh, it, it's particularly been, and I just appreciate so much, uh, uh, Shaheen, both your um, uh, ability to situate this issue within a larger context of healthcare coverage determinations and struggles over insurance and, and struggles over professional identity. You know, am I a doctor or am I, am I a lawyer and advocate? Um, perhaps I'm both at this point. You know, and those, those sorts of questions are really fascinating. Um, I will note that we are 
I want to be respectful of everyone's time and keep everything uh, on, a, on the schedule. So we're going to have a break now. Uh, we go on break from 1230 to 1240. Um, and then we have our, our second panel, which is on the practical realities of obtaining healthcare coverage um, uh, for clients. So thanks again uh, to Shaheen and to everyone else. And um, we'll be back at 1240. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I think we are going to uh, get started again uh, with our second panel. Um, just want to thank again Professor Talesh for his excellent uh, presentation uh, earlier this morning. Um, uh, incredibly informative and I think uh, really um, exciting research. So thank you so much for that. Um, so for our second panel, uh, we are going to continue talking about the practical realities of accessing uh, gender affirming health care uh, for transgender people. Um, and I want to, before we start, just remind everybody that we are recording this uh, presentation. Um, as noted earlier, uh, it will uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks be available on the Brooklyn Law School YouTube channel um, for educational purposes. And so just so that everyone's aware of that, I also just wanted to note that uh, we welcome uh, questions from everyone who's listening today. Um, so if you have a question, please um, drop it in the Q&A uh, or you can post it uh, in the chat. Um, I'll keep an eye for those questions so that we can um, put them to our panelists as we go along. Uh, but I want to just start now by introducing uh, the folks who will be talking with us uh, today about some of the practical realities confronting uh, trans folks uh, trying to access uh, health care. Um, so I want to start uh, first with an alum of the law school who were just so excited uh, that she could come back and uh, join us today. Uh, Alejandra Carabolo uh, is, a, as I said, a Brooklyn Law School graduate and currently a clinical instructor at Harvard Law School. Uh, prior to uh, joining the faculty at Harvard, Alejandra was a staff attorney at the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund uh, and a staff attorney at the LGBTQ Law Project at the New York Legal Assistance Group. Uh, her professional focus uh, in those positions has been on advancing the civil rights of LGBTQ people in a variety of civil legal contexts, including healthcare access, uh, as well as immigration, family law, and other areas. Um, and again, we're just so excited to welcome her back uh, to speak to us uh, this afternoon. Um, I also wanted to introduce two uh, students who are currently uh, members of the LGBTQ Advocacy Clinic um, that I teach at Brooklyn Law School, uh, Sophia Kaufman and Walker Shockley. Um, uh, both of whom are going to speak about some of the work that they are doing uh, in the clinic this semester on behalf of transgender clients um, who have been denied access to health care. Uh, Walker Shockley is a second year student at BLS. Uh, he, in addition to being in the clinic, is a member of the Brooklyn Journal for International Law and a fellow at the Dennis Block Center for the Study of International Business Law. Um, and Sophia Kaufman is a third year student at BLS a graduate of Allegheny College um, and has served as an intern at Riza Permahadi PC, uh, as well as uh, prior uh, in, in prior times, an intern in Brooklyn Law School's Pandemic Employment Relief Clinic. Um, so thank you all uh, for agreeing to speak with us today. Um, Alejandra, I'm, I'm excited to turn it over to you. Thank you again. Thank you, Susan. Um, let me go ahead and get the slideshow started. Okay, so I'm just going to be going over a bit of um, kind of the, the broader issues of obtaining gender affirming care um, and from a legal perspective um, and some of the barriers that present themselves um, and how to actually kind of uh, get around those um, for, from a legal perspective and some of the, the, the ways that um, I've been able to, to get clients um, uh, gender affirming care. I've worked on cases to get uh, clients gender affirming care. Um, so I think one of the common misconceptions about gender affirming care is that um, this is relatively new or 
that the fight to get it covered is relatively new when it actually isn't. Um, there were actually quite a few groundbreaking cases in the 1970s that were working to get um, transition care covered um, uh, for, for um, trans folks. Um, there had actually been a clinic at Johns Hopkins that was founded in the late 60s um, and had kept going. And there had been quite a bit of advances in, in multiple clinics around the country. Um, and 1979 really proved kind of a watershed moment in terms of a, a change in terms of coverage. Um, there had been some steam gaining, um, unfortunately, with the election of, of Ronald Reagan um, and the 1982 decision by the Center for Medicaid Services um, uh, to classify gender affirming care as experimental, um, basically set back trans medicine nearly 30 years. Um, it took about 30 years to, to basically get back to the point where insurance companies would even consider covering um, gender affirming care at all. Um, and it, uh, it really took uh, the Affordable Care Act and Section 1557 to really spur kind of this new push uh, to make sure that gender affirming care is covered. Um, and so one of the reasons why, you know, that 1982 decision was so problematic is it creates this kind of catch-22 or, or cycle of exclusion where you end up with a lack of insurance coverage, which then means that it, um, qualified providers don't want to provide the service because they're not going to be compensated, um, which then means that there's a lack of access and treatment. And because there's a lack of access and treatment, there's a lack of studies uh, that are conducted on those patients to then reinforce whether or not the um, treatment is actually effective um, and safe. And then because there's a lack of treatment and, uh, or I mean a lack of studies, it's not taken seriously as a um, treatment or um, as a part of the medical profession. And so it just kind of is this vicious circle. Um, and fortunately, the ACA was really able to help kind of break out of that um, circle by, by implementing solid protections and in 2016 with the uh, ruled by the Obama administration that insurance companies had to cover uh, gender affirming care and could not categorically exclude it, um, really helped break that kind of chain. And so really in the last five years, we've seen kind of this huge change in insurance companies covering gender affirming care. That being said, there still remains a lot of areas where um, gender affirming care is not covered. Um, this is a recent study coming out of the Center for American Progress, which reports that nearly one in two trans folks um, has had insurers deny them for coverage for gender affirming care. Um, on a personal note, I it was kind of funny when uh, I was speaking with um, uh, Professor Hazel Dean and, and Dean uh, Karen Porter um, uh, about setting up this uh, panel. Um, I had actually just gotten off the phone with my insurance company because they had denied uh, a gender affirming procedure. So even this is still happening, even with good insurance and having everything and, you know, me being kind of privileged with having uh, a lot of background knowledge and uh, legal skills to be able to navigate this system. Um, it is still extremely hard for trans folks to be able to, to probably navigate and make sure that their care gets covered. Um, so really, there, there's, I think, um, uh, Professor Tush did a really great job of breaking down some of the issues with uh, types of exclusions. Um, so there's really kind of two main ones um, that I've really encountered. There's kind of the, the broad categorical exclusion. It basically says any type of uh, gender affirming care is um, uh, categorically excluded. It include hormones, it'll include surgery, it'll include therapy, pretty much everything is already excluded. Um, and then what's becoming kind of more common are these kind of partial exclusions where they'll cover the bare basics, they'll cover hormones, they'll cover therapy, they'll cover you know, blood work, those kinds of things. And then they may cover um, things like uh, uh, surgeries that affect primary sexual uh, or sex characteristics, um, such as uh, quote unquote bottom surgery. Uh, but then will not cover other um, procedures. Um, and this oftentimes um, ends up being disproportionate against trans women. Um, and so many of these categorical exclusions um, are usually part of state employee health plans um, and state Medicaid plans. I think uh, the most egregious examples of these kinds of categorical exclusions tend to be in state health plans or state-sponsored healthcare. Um, some private employers as well, particularly in the self-funded space. Um, so uh, just as a quick primer, there's kind of two ways that insure, uh, private employers can provide health insurance. They can either do it 
by self-funding where it's administered by a health insurance company, but the underlying liability for the coverage of care falls with the employer. And then there's called what's like small group plans that are purchased on an open market by the employer to cover their employees. Those small group plans are subject to much more regulation by state and regulators than the self-funded plans. The self-funded plans are, are um, uh, preempted by ERISA. And so that means that only the federal government can regulate those plans. And um, so a lot of the more egregious uh, exemption or uh, exclusions have occurred with self-funded plans. Um, and then even when employers do not wish to cover gender affirming care and it's offered as part of a um, small group plan bought from an insurance company, um, oftentimes they still request the insurance company not cover this care, and then they have to sign an indemnity waiver with the insurance company um, because the insurance company will say this is against the law to exclude this care, and the insurance company does not want to be on the hook or liable. Um, and I think one of the, the other um, kind of lesser known one is uh, TRICARE, um, or healthcare for dependents of military, active military members. Um, there is a congressional, I mean, a, a statute that uh, prohibits gender affirming care. Um, and there, uh, so far that has not been a successful challenge. I know there's been a lot of folks that have been looking into this and it's hope, hopefully something that will change in the near future. Um, but it's kind of a weird area now where active duty military can get gender affirming care covered, but then their spouses and dependents cannot. Um, so these are kind of two examples that I've encountered through my time and uh, when I worked at TILDAF. Um, these are both kind of cut out of the, the booklets um, for the plans in, in those cases in the, uh, North Carolina. This came from the, the KW Falwell case, and this is the state health, uh, uh, health plan exclusion. Uh, and for all employees and dependents in the state of North Carolina. Um, in that particular case, there was a bit of a, uh, a window where care was covered um, in the year, in 2018, um, the exclusion was removed um, by vote of the board of trustees. Um, and then there was, an, uh, during the election, a uh, Dale Fulwell uh, Republican was elected as state treasurer. And his one of his first things was to remove the exclusion, or I mean, to re uh, allow the sunset of the removal of the exclusion so that it would just be automatically re-implemented. Um, and then this one was another case that I worked on at Tilda uh, Houston v, uh, I mean, uh, Lang v. Houston County, Georgia. Um, and so these are kind of the same things where they just kind of say, um, this one's even kind of more just old school. I mean, it's rare to see, um, you know, I, I'd say with the government ones, you kind of see this like sex change. And oftentimes these are 20, 30 year old exclusions that have just been continuously renewed. Um, and so they even still use very outdated language about what care is, is, is and isn't covered. Uh, so some of the par uh, partial exclusions, um, again, as I was mentioning, um, disproportionately affect trans women. A lot of these things are a lot of care. And this you know, typically applies to the large insurers like United Healthcare, Cigna, Aetna, um, and um, might be missing one, um, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, they typically will cover most um, uh, care, including bottom surgery, and uh, which includes vaginoplasty um, and metrodioplasty um, and phalloplasty for trans men and top surgery for trans men, um, but then uh, excludes a lot of the feminizing care um, that work to alter secondary sex characteristics. So a lot of the stuff that ends up being excluded, again, it typically affects trans women is uh, facial feminization surgery, breast augmentation, voice therapy, and surgery, body contouring, and hair removal. Um, and a lot of those things are typically presumptively stated as um, cosmetic. And one of the main issues is that a lot of the insurance companies will say, we're not denying um, care that's uh, medically necessary. We just view that this care in particular is presumptively cosmetic, and it doesn't matter how many um, letters of medical necessity from various providers, um, they'll just say that it's not medically necessary. And it's just, just, just kind of like Kafkaesque nightmare where they just, uh, you know, they say, we, we evaluated it for medically, medical necessity, but we did so by looking to our policy, which then states that it's not medically necessary. And, and so it's, they're not actually doing any kind of evaluation. And then they point to that and say that they're not discriminating. Um, and so uh, again, most of these partial exclusions are in the small and large group uh, plans that are sold on markets. 
And so these are kind of two of the examples. The one on the left is Cigna and the one on the right is United Healthcare. Um, and so typically, like I said, they'll say it's considered not medically necessary under this uh, standard plan language. Um, and then they just kind of point to that when they deny it. Um, and then what's even worse is when independent reviewers um, or even, uh, or when you get external appeals through insurance regulators, they oftentimes then just defer to what the insurance company has, even though they're not supposed to, they defer to what the insurance company has already um, decided. Um, and so it just kind of becomes this self-reinforcing um, uh, cycle. Um, and I think one thing that's interesting about Cigna is that actually in March of this year, they actually had, so if you notice on the one part, it says for New York regulated benefit plans, it says it has to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, um, they had actually rolled that out nationwide. They had made it that every gender affirming procedure was evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. That lasted about two months. Um, and then in uh, March 8th, or not March 8th, May 18th, they rolled it back and then limited it to just New York. That is a case-by-case -case basis. And this is a response to um, pressure from the Department of Financial Services, uh, which had uh, uh, kind of looked into this issue and really said that they were not really looking at a case-by-case -case basis. They were referring to kind of a blanket exclusion and saying that they're not denying it on basis of, not, uh, of cosmetic exclusion, but they really were. Um, it's just this kind of shell game. Um, and United kind of did the same thing. And so there, you can see it there. It says for New York plans refer to benefit considerations. Um, and uh, I had a, a tweet go viral in June because of course Cigna decided to tweet happy pride on June 1st, um, two weeks right after they rolled back um, coverage for, for trans folks. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of the, the, the broader issue. And it really is, is kind of, it really makes no sense as to why um, they rolled this out nationwide, and then two months later, they just ended up just limiting it to New York. Um, but as other states, such as Washington, um, start to pass more affirmative bills, including coverage, um, it's going to be harder and harder for these companies to kind of just carve out specific states, and it's just going to be easier for them just to roll things out nationwide. Um, so some of the legal protections, um, there, there's a various amount, um, depending on uh, where the exclusion or where the the barrier to access of care um, is. Um, if it's through an employer, Title VII uh, will apply, particularly after Bostock. Um, and then the Americans with Disability Act. Um, so I, I wanna make a careful distinction with this one. Um, being trans in itself is not a disability. Having gender dysphoria can be a disability. Um, and so that's one of the things that, um, you know, when, when I worked at TILDEF, we were trying to, to push. Um, as part of our, our broader strategy is to, to include um, disability claims for, for gender dysphoria. Um, Title IX, so in the Cato case that I worked on, because it involved employees of universities, the University of North Carolina, um, Title IX will also provide protections um, for people employed or students uh, working in educational settings or, or studying in education or at universities or schools. Um, Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, that's one of the, the kind of biggest um, ones, and it also provides a private right of action. Um, there's been a huge back and forth between, uh, in, in HHS, between rules that will uh, uh, push providers to actually have to cover this care um, and not deny people on the basis of their gender identity. Um, and uh, the, the 2016 rule was pretty quickly um, enjoined in Texas. Um, within a few months of, of it going into effect. Um, and that basically stayed that way until 2020 when the Trump administration issued its new rule three days before Bost uh, Bostock was decided. Um, and then that rule was then enjoined. And then now the Department of HHS is engaged in new rulemaking to kind of replace the Trump rule. So, um, and I, I predict that will probably get enjoined pretty quickly again in Texas. Um, and so it, unfortunately, you know, 15, the reality of section 1557 is that, you know, many employers and many insurance companies will still comply even when there's no, or, or even when the threat of enforcement is uh, enjoined. Uh, but, you know, section 1557 still provides a private right of action. Um, Ar ERISA is another avenue to challenge some of the medical necessity denials. Um, unfortunately, ERISA, the case law and precedent around ERISA is just, it's, it's an absolute mess and is one of the more complicated um, avenues of challenging exclusions. Uh, but one of the 
the, the issues is that ERISA requires insurers to act as a fiduciary to their um, pay, uh, or to their um, customers or, or the, the patients. And um, oftentimes by denying this care, they are not engaging in, in, in their fiduciary duty, especially when they do so in an arbitrary way. And for many of you who've taken admin law or um, uh, know what Chevron deference is, um, it, it's almost a very similar way in how they, they evaluate insurance company decisions. They look for arbitrary and capriciousness in, whether, in how they evaluate these claims. Um, there's a ton of in state insurance ability to regulate, especially among small group plans or exchange plans on the, the um, Affordable Care Act exchanges, um, as well as state Medicaid cases. Um, and then state non-discrimination law can also um, uh, play a role. Um, so kind of the, the key issue of like determining how to challenge a healthcare exclusion is who is providing the coverage, right? Is it the government or the or a private employer? And this really can be a huge difference into how it can be challenged and whether or not um, the care will basically, or, or the barrier will be insurmountable kind of to the average person seeking care. There's kind of three ways you can go about it. And each one is kind of informed by various factors, like what type of exclusion, um, who the employer is, whether or not it's the insurer that does it. Um, so really there's kind of You've got filing a lawsuit, which you know is often the case that's required when it's a, a government exclusion because there's often political considerations. Um, there's uh, structure negotiation, which uh, my colleague, um, at, uh, well, now formerly at, at Tildef, um, apologies, because he, he recently just left Tildef as well, uh, Noah Lewis um, was an abs just uh, incredibly effective at getting major insurers to cover care through structure negotiation. It was actually just kind of astounding how much um, coverage he was able to get uh, voluntarily by these insurance companies through a structure negotiation process. So, I, and I encourage uh, many of you to read um, the book Structure Negotiation by Lainey Feingold. It is a fantastic book and can really help you think of creative ways to get around um, uh, various issues. And then there's also um, external appeals to um, administrative agencies or complaints to insurance regulators. Um, you know, there, there's also the ability to file a complaint with the Department of HHS Office for Civil Rights. Um, although I, I'm not sure how much they're acting on those given the state of um, uh, various injunctions at, at different levels and, and just the new rule being implemented. Um, so again, kind of going back to government-based exclusions, um, so it, it's particularly ish, an issue when you have like uh, political uh, leaders that, that are involved because those categorical exclusions um, are difficult to remove basically because they, they view it as a political issue rather than anything else. And so um, it's really hard to, to convince them to, to remove those exclusions. Um, things like TRICARE and Medicaid can sometimes be based on statutes, TRICARE uh, federal uh, statutes and Medicaid, and for an example, in Iowa, where they actually got the Medicaid exclusion overturned, and then the state legislature went back and then re-implemented another exclusion and tried to strip jurisdiction from the state Supreme Court to even review it. Um, it, was, it was just pretty blatant. Um, and then, uh, you know, in, in these, again, the government ones tend to have to be resolved through lawsuits. Um, in Houston County, Georgia, which is a small county, um, you know, they, uh, the, the county board continuously renewed the exclusion, even though, you know, people were, were testifying at the, the county level um, uh, to remove the exclusion and they kept citing cost. Um, and it was remarkable in that case because the, the cert, their estimate of the cost of the surgery was $25,000 and they're fighting tooth and nail in court to fight, to, to not cover a surgery that cost $25,000. And as of, I believe, the beginning of last of this most recent summer, they had spent over half a million dollars in legal fees. Um, so, you know, being exclusionary and, and discriminatory is, is, is costly. Um, you know, they spent half a million dollars to avoid paying a $25,000 surgery. Um, and so the Kate Alfie Fowell case is one I worked on in North Carolina. Again, this is the um, exclusion um, that affects all state health or state employees. Um, and this is Dale Fowell, the treasurer. And you know, he immediately came in and was basically looking for a way to not cover this care. Um, so some of the private 
uh, employer-based exclusions, uh, some of the particular issues, um, especially when it's employer-directed ex in, uh, exclusions. One of the things I, I briefly mentioned earlier um, is like when it's self-funded, the employer has the ultimate arbiter of what's covered and what's not. Um, and then when um, it's small group plans, the insurer, even if, if it's purchased off a plan, can have third-party administrator liability. Um, there was a case in the Eighth Circuit, um, uh, the name is escaping me right now, that, that basically found that insurance companies do have uh, third-party liability um, as Title VII agents of employers if they implement these exclusions. So what insurers have started to do now is they sign indemnity forms with employers that basically say, you know, you realize that this is violating federal law. And if we are sued, you agree to take on all of the liability and some employers still choose to do so. Um, and then, so some of the um, exclusions are by insurers themselves. Um, this can oftentimes happen when, um, you know, I think one of the most common examples I've seen of this is actually in unions. Um, oftentimes union group plans aren't regularly updated um, and they oftentimes don't know about their own exclusions. They don't even realize this is an issue until a trans employee brings it up or somebody brings it up to them. Um, uh, I had uh, um, a friend who was uh, in, I think the, the union that represents all of the um, liquor distributors in New York City and, and their plan had a, a exclusion. And when they brought it up to the, the, um, the union officials, they didn't even know that was in there. They were actually going to actively look to remove it. And so sometimes it's not a, a malicious thing. They just, these are just legacy exclusions. And oftentimes the current people in charge don't even realize that they're still in the plans. Um, so yeah, again, as, as I mentioned, structure negotiation is a really effective way. Um, my colleague Noah was able to get um, Aetna to cover, expand their coverage for, for gender affirming surgeries nationwide through a structure negotiation process. Um, it really requires the other party to um, operate in good faith, um, but it can really result in a win-win. Aetna gets the kind of positive press coverage that they expanded care. Uh, patients are able to get um, access to that care um, and it avoids the expense and the timeliness of litigation. I mean, th this search and negotiation process can take under a year and can achieve pretty, pretty broad results um, that may take years and years in, a, in court. Um, one of the other ways is uh, finally, again, administrative appeals. Um, these are typically kind of reserved for small group plans or large group plans. Um, regulated by state insurance regulators. Um, and so in, particularly in New York, it's the New York Department of Financial Services that oversees these particular um, types of appeals. Um, unfortunately, self-funded, um, and this is typical of large employers, like let's say like a Google or Starbucks or um, uh, you know, MetLife, um, th this really isn't an option because they're preempted by ERISA. Again, ERISA may be another option, but it's typically very, very difficult. Um, and so, um, I wanted to include this here. This is actually a appeals letter from um, a external reviewer that found um, that a surgery was uh, medically necessary um, and was reported to the Department of Financial Services. And so um, in this case, the underlying insurance denial was overturned by the external reviewer. Um, one of the things I highlighted earlier in one of my comments um, to Professor Talesh is that there's still quite an issue with external appeals. Um, this is uh, one, This is actually my <laughs> own appeal that was not overturned. Um, and some of the language is just not like great. And um, I forgot to include it, but the actual citations and bibliography used, I don't believe there was any medical literature that was used that was newer than 2005. And this was a pre-authorization for facial feminization surgery. And it was using literature from like 1992 dealing with vaginoplasty. So there, there was literally almost no real medical literature review done as part of this medical necessity denial. Um, and this later became an impetus to uh, um, pressure Department of Financial Services here in New York to change their process and make sure that their independent reviewers were using accurate and, and up-to-date medical literature um, and uh, so far that's been a, a much better process and they've really worked to, to uh, enhance the process and make sure that, that trans folks are actually getting a fair shake at these external uh, appeals. 
Um, I think as, as Professor Hazeldean mentioned earlier, um, this is uh, kind of one of the newer things that's come out in the last year and a half is these states are now targeting trans youth healthcare. Um, uh, Arkansas and Tennessee both passed bills, although the Tennessee one is a little bit limited because it doesn't not actually impact anybody because they're restricting hormones and puberty blockers and surgery for anyone who has not reached puberty, but that was never done anyway. So that's not um, really have any actual impact, um, but there's a, a concern that they may increase the age next year um, as a quick amendment and then um, it could, could cause serious issues. Um, and Arkansas's bill is, is currently um, enjoined, uh, but there is an appeal up at the Eighth Circuit, so it remains to be seen. Uh, Texas had several bills um, that would have treated um, uh, affirming a minor's uh, gender as uh, child abuse. Um, Alabama would have made it a felony um, to even refer uh, children to other doctors out of state um, for gender affirming care um, and would have required teachers to essentially out uh, any student who's considered to be gender non-conforming to their parents. Otherwise, they would face a misdemeanor. Um, I mean, it, it's pretty uh, draconian stuff that's been coming out over the last year and a half. And the, the advocates on the ground have just done a fantastic job. But there's, there's really been this kind of reactionary backlash to the advances in, in coverage for trans health care. Um, and really, they're, they're targeting the most vulnerable at this point. They're really going after um, trans kids. And the, the amount of, of um, trauma, you know, kids have to, to bear because, you know, imagine having your healthcare just ripped out from underneath you, um, you know, when you're 13, 14 years old. Um, it, it's just incredibly traumatic and, and Trans Lifeline and other, so, uh, and Trevor Project and other support um, uh, groups have, have really experienced an uptick in calls um, because of the just huge number of anti-trans bills that have passed or, or are being pushed. Uh, Texas last week um, just passed their um, ban on trans kids uh, participating in sports. So, you know, this is, while there have been a lot of advances in trans healthcare over the last five years, um, there, there really is a, a reactionary backlash brewing and it, it's really uh, becoming a, a particular issue. Um, so that uh, concludes my portion and I will pass it on to Professor Hazeldean. Thank you so much, Alejandra. Really, uh, really appreciate your remarks. So informative um, and, and so, many, so much to think about there. Thank you so much. Um, so I think now I'm going to turn it over uh, to Sophia Kaufman um, to discuss uh, difficulties affecting um, people seeking coverage for health care through uh, government plans such as Medicare. Yes, hi. Um, I want to begin by thanking the Center for Health Science and Public Policy and the LGBTQ Advocacy, Advocacy Clinic for hosting the seminar today. Um, I would also like to thank Professor Hazeldean for inviting me to speak. And I would like to thank, my, and thank and acknowledge my group members who could not be here today, Leilani O'Sullivan and Jackie Kushner, for working alongside me all semester um, on our project. So as mentioned before, my name is Sophia Kaufman. I am currently enrolled in the clinic. And today I will be talking about specifically the difficulties faced by transgender individuals in, in accessing gender affirming healthcare through Medicare. So as a little background, as Alejandra mentioned, Medicare used to exclude gender affirming care across the board. And then that was changed when the blanket ban was lifted. Now it's extensively covered, but people still cannot access gender affirming healthcare. There is still this incredible bias set against people who need this care because it is seen as experimental or cosmetic. In the case of our client, she has been denied gender from health care in the form of facial reconstructive surgery, also known as facial feminization surgery. Our client is a transgender woman who has been seeking facial surgery and who has been denied on the basis that it is seen as cosmetic. Um, it is not fixed at the front. Let me close a window. Hold on one second. Oh, right, Sophia. Living. Yes. <laughs> um, it's not fixing a deformity, and there's a lot of scientific evidence that proves this procedure is helpful in alleviating gender dysphoria. 
Um, all this is wrong and false, um, and she has an upcoming ALJ hearing. It's also interesting to note that she is a Medicare recipient in addition to having private health insurance. So she enrolled in private insurance in addition to Medicare in order to get the benefits that are offered to private beneficiaries. The private insurance is responsible for administering her benefits and adjusting to her private insurance benefits. The client submitted a prior authorization for this procedure and was denied. The insurance company denied the procedure on the basis that it was cosmetic um, and it was not fixing a deformity and it was experimental. One of the issues is that ostensibly the insurance company did not consider her case. They just denied it on the basis that it's cosmetic across the board and not medically necessary. She has had to appeal up to the bureaucracy in order to have an administrative hearing. This procedure is medically necessary for several reasons. First of all, her doctors say it's medically necessary. Our client has a well-diagnosed case of severe gender dysphoria. Every doctor who has seen her has diagnosed her with gender dysphoria. All of her doctors agree that facial reconstructive surgery is medically necessary to treat the dysphoria. Um, and second, WPATH states that it is necess it's a necessary procedure to alleviate gender dysphoria. So WPATH is the leading global body on appropriate care for transgender individuals. While WPATH has a clear standards for what is necessary in order to qualify for what is known as top and bottom surgery, WPATH states that facial reconstructive surgery is a procedure that requires an individualized determination from the treating physician. WPATH's guidance states that in determining whether a procedure is medically necessary is highly individualized and requires evaluation specific to each transgender person. And as such, the WPATH affords deference that determinations made by qualified professionals after the evaluation on the specific individual's needs. Um, in this instance, the insurance company is arguing that a lack of a definition um, and a lack of criteria means that WPATH is stating that facial reconstructive surgery is not me medically necessary. However, WPATH's policy is clear and explicit. Facial reconstructive surgery recognizes effective treatment for gender dysphoria, and the procedure, when prescribed, is not cosmetic and should be considered medically necessary. Facial reconstructive surgery for our client could be quite frankly life-changing. Our client is on Medicare because of a disability. She is incredibly isolated. She would like to go into the community. She wants to have family. She wants to have a job. She wants to have a career. She wants to have a life. She wants to live on her own. She is afraid that people will recognize her as a transgender woman, which could cause violence against her. She is openly mocked and misgendered every time she leaves her home. And as a result, she rarely leaves her home except for doctor's appointments. Medicare and her private insurance is denying her a procedure that will allow her to more fully participate in the world and in her community. The fact is that she also has had to jump through several bureaucratic hoops just to obtain a hearing. This is an incredibly onerous and taxing process on her that has weighed heavily and caused her a significant amount of distress, in addition to the stress she already experiences due to her gender dysphoria. So I want to thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Sophia. Uh, really appreciate uh, your comments. And I, I do just want to remind um, everyone that we absolutely welcome questions. So if anything occurs to you that you'd like to hear more about as we go along, uh, please do feel free to drop that in the chat or in the Q&A. We will have some time for Q&A um, after we've uh, all the panelists have spoken and we look forward to a, a dialogue then. Um, all right, well, I'm going to turn it now over to Walker Shockley for his presentation. Cool. I'm going to share my screen really fast. Uh, so, yeah, I am happy to be here. I have been working this semester on a case. Uh, Walker, do, you to, do you want to put that on a slideshow? So, there we go. Perfect. There it is. Yeah, I have to move something and find out where it was. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've been working on a case this semester uh, that's covering issues relating to trans healthcare in prison. So I'm really excited to, well, not excited, but I'm glad to speak about this because I think it's a topic that is often overlooked in the public debate, um, but one that I think when examined kind of exposes the barbarism of our modern penal system with acute detail. 
Um, so before I get into that, I just want to say thank you to Professor Hazeldean and the clinic for inviting me to participate in today's panel. Um, and thank you for, to my clinic partner, Slay Latham, uh, who helped me put this together. Uh, so I'm going to proceed first by identifying and contextualizing the problem as I see it, uh, then by explaining the law affecting trans inmates and their access to medical care, and then I'll close by sharing how we're seeing the legal and personal issues play out in our client's case. Just a disclaimer, when I use the word trans, I'm referring to non-cis folks generally, including, for example, uh, those who identify as gender non um, so first, the problem. Uh, I'll be explicit. The current situation is that trans people are grossly over overrepresented in prisons and jails. They experience physical and psychological harm at disproportionately high levels relative to their cis peers. And we, through our democratically elected institutions, frankly, um, practically eliminate their access to the specialized medical care that they need, you know, the care that others in today's session have explained is so important. Um, as you can see, trans folks have disproportionately high experience with the carceral system as compared to the rest of society. 16% uh, of transgender non-conforming respondents uh, or yeah, non Conforming response to the National Transgender Discrimination Survey indicated they had spent time in jail or prison. One in five trans women have spent time in prison or jail, and the number for trans men is about one in 10. Um, for context, only about one in 20 American adults will spend time in prison during their lives. Um, additionally, the time which these trans people spend on the inside is to disproportionately traumatic, at least when measured in terms of sexual victimization. Um, the DOJ reported, you know, back in like 2013, um, that in 2011, 2012, 39.9% of transgender adult inmates reported sexual victimization while in jail. Um, so while I won't be discussing sexual violence inflicted on trans inmates, I think it's worth noting because whereas the rate of sexual victimization among all inmates is already too high at 7.3%. The fact that two in five trans and gender non-conforming inmates experience this kind of violence while in prison is a sober reflection of the insecurity this vulnerable population faces. On top of that, a handful of state legislatures targeted trans inmates specifically by enacting laws which prohibit departments of correction from using state funds or resources to provide people under their custody, quote unquote, sex reassignment surgery. Um, many of these statutes also restrict inmates access to gender affirming hormone treatment. And some, including the one at issue in the case we're working on this semester, uh, established so-called freeze frame policies. The effect of these policies is that the Department of Corrections will continue providing hormone treatment to inmates if they were receiving treatment um, at the time of incarceration, but only so long as it's medically necessary. Um, and if the inmate had not been receiving hormone treatment at the time of incarceration, the statute purportedly restricts the corrections department's ability to provide that form of care. Um, some circuits have struck down these statutes as practically per se unconstitutional. They will require um, Departments of Correction to kind of evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis whether or not uh, the you know need is the medical need is serious um, and therefore warrants treatment. In others, they are very much still in force. Um, the case my clinic partner and I are working on this semester arose from the Department of Corrections interpretation of these of a so-called freeze frame policy. But regardless, uh, I think we see patterns like this and wonder how might we use the law to help as lawyers and law students. Um, and so relevant to this seminar, the issue of trans inmates access to necessary medical care implicates constitutional and federal state statutory law. Um, as far as the Constitution is concerned, the Eighth Amendment prohibit, uh, prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. Um, and the court has read that as also creating officials from exercising deliberate indifference to prisoners' serious medical needs. Um, 
but Congress has made it difficult for inmates to raise these kind of Eighth Amendment claims, seeking injunctive relief for access to necessary medical care when they're denied um, access by the prison, kind of like, you know, through their regular process. Um, with implementation of the Prison Litigation Reform Act, uh, or the PLRA. It was enacted under the auspices of excluding frivolous lawsuits from the federal docket, and it has achieved that by requiring inmates to exhaust administrative remedies, to pay court filing fees, as well as by implementing other provisions, such as three strike style rules and a physical injury requirement, um, at least with respect to claim seeking money damages. So against that backdrop, uh, Slay and I have been representing a trans woman in her effort to secure medically necessary gender affirming hormone treatment. And the matter has required us to kind of sort through the interrelation of these laws. Um, her client was 19 years old. Um, she is 19 years old. She is a third of the way through an estimated 23 year sentence. Um, coming into custody uh, in a Southern state when she was 14, our client had neither come out as trans nor received a diagnosis of gender dysphoria at the time of her incarceration. Indeed, it is all within the last year that she came out as trans to her family and the prison community that she received her diagnosis of gender dysphoria and that she legally changed her name. So when our client requested feminizing hormone therapy, uh, treatment which a clinical psychologist deemed medically necessary. The Department of Corrections denied her request, noting that the department will continue uh, hormone treatment if started prior to coming in, it will not start it. It appears that they interpreted a law as an effective free spring policy, uh, precluding them from providing medically necessary hormone treatment to inmates who are trans um, when they have embraced their identities only after becoming inmates. Uh, my take is kind of like, they're quite literally saying, we've identified you as an inmate before we've, or before you identify as trans. Um, and so anyways, our client has filed numerous related requests, petitioning different parts of the department's bureaucracy to evaluate her case, only to receive similar responses or to be directed elsewhere for resolution. Um, they're giving her the runaround. She has also filed numerous grievances in accordance with the Department of Corrections grievance policy, including one which she initiated in June, but in connection with which she has yet to hear back. On the assumption that her client will not receive a favorable disposition of her request for hormone treatment, Slay and I have spent the semester examining the Correction Department's grievance policy, its policy regarding trans inmate care, and we're currently exploring our client's ability to claim violations of her Eighth Amendment rights against uh, cruel and unusual punishment. And before the semester, that will probably uh, research other causes of action as well. But for me, I want to emphasize the kind of context which has required us to explore these issues. Um, our client is a teenager <laughs> and she has done the things queer teenagers have done for decades now, and myself included. Uh, she scavenged for information about her identity once asking a sympathetic theater instructor for relevant resources, and she slowly confided her cross-gender feelings in a handful of trusted friends. Um, but she's also been trapped in this kind of multidimensional imprisonment. Uh, there's her physical incarceration, obviously. Then there's her mental and emotional recognition that the, you know, her identity misaligns with her physical body. Uh, and then there's also the psychological dam damage and social humiliation, which comes every time the prison processes her under her dead name, or even calls her by her dead name over the intercom for her peers to hear or denies her female commissary items. And I think this happens everywhere, likely on scale, which we can't fully appreciate, you know, based on a quick reading of the stats I mentioned earlier, we'd like to think the constitution through its criminal protections, uh, including the Eighth Amendment, would create a kind of fail-safe prohibiting these egregiously inhumane treatments um, of people who society has taken into custody. But you know, the ostensibly democratic bodies at both the federal and state levels um, pass legislation such as the PLRA or freeze frame policies uh, and thus kind of extract, I think, a political economy from 
unrepresented and not uncommonly trans bodies, um, first by making it difficult for them to access the care and security of self they need, and then by making it hard for them to seek legal recourse when that access is ultimately unavailable. Um, but that's what we're trying to change here at the clinic, at least this semester. So um, with that, I'll close and say thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, really appreciate all those presentations. Um, and uh, again, uh, if folks have questions or, uh, or comments that they'd like to share, um, please feel free to put those in the chat um, or to drop them in the Q&A. Um, we're uh, happy to you know, hear, hear your thoughts and your commentary as well. We have about 15 more minutes um, for that. Um, and I will note that um, we have one comment uh, in the in the chat that I don't know if uh, Alejandra you want to respond to, um, which is asking uh, whether you could comment on enforcement efforts around New York's fertility preservation law um, that mandates insurance coverage uh, for. Um, fertility, either for, or basically for preserving gametes, uh, sperm or eggs, uh, for a person who is about to start um, gender affirming hormone therapy. Um, and I guess, uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on whether that uh, legislation has been positive or, or has been helpful uh, or is being enforced. Unfortunately, I'm not as um, involved in, or hadn't been as involved in this effort. So I'm, I'm not, I don't have a, a solid answer to that my colleague, um, uh, Charlie Arrowwood, um, who works at Arrowwood Legal, um, has been much more involved in this particular issue and be much more knowledgeable about it than I. Well, uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but thank no you uh, for for uh, for, um, for for jumping in with that and uh, appreciate that and um, thank you for uh, for the question, uh, Melissa. Appreciate it. Um, so I, I would love to sort of put a, a, a question um, to the panel, um, you know, for anyone who sort of wants to take a stab at answering it. I guess if, you know, um, I sometimes ask this to my students sort of on the last day of class um, in our clinic. Uh, and so I guess it's coming a little bit early uh, for Sophia and Walker. Um, but I guess if, if you were, you know, um, if you sort of were the all-powerful ruler, uh, you know, the, the, the queen or the king or the emperor or, or whatever, and had the ability to really change something about the systems that you've been interacting with, or what, what do you think would be sort of the most positive thing um, that could change that might improve the situation with respect to access for um, trans folks seeking medical care? Like, what, what do you think would be sort of the, the most positive change that, that could occur that might resolve some of these issues? I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, so I think what, what's most frustrating with our situation is that we have um, an insurance provider who's never met this patient, they have never evaluated this patient, and they're making a medical determination um, about what is medically necessary. And they are not just taking her doctors at their words and saying this is medically necessary, she needs these healthcare procedures, please provide them to her. So if I were in charge, I would just let a deference to doctors be the standard. Thanks, Sophia, I appreciate that. Um, Alejandro Walker, I don't know if you have anything you wanna to add to that or, if, or maybe that's the best answer ultimately, I don't know. I mean, I think one of the things that I think will be really helpful is a, the newer WPATH standards um, coming out, I, hopefully at some point this year, um, because the, the current WPATH standards um, are now 10 years old. And um, a lot of the language around the care that still remains to be, that is still excluded, um, particularly around feminizing care, um, like facial feminization surgery and others, um, typically, um, uh, it, like WPAT just hasn't had as much strong language around it. And that's one of the reasons why insurers have been able to kind of get around what the WPAT says. And additionally, really just the, the amount of sea change in the last few years in terms of coverage has just produced an immense amount of new 
um, medical data and medical studies that can help bolster a lot of the treatments um, and coverage for them. So I'm, I'm really hoping that to be able to utilize the new WPATH standards um, to, to encourage more coverage. Um, I, my spear cut out, so I apologize if I repeat anything that Sophia said. I think that um, if I could change something, I would really encourage decision makers at the legislative and judicial kind of um, levels to consider kind of agnostic approaches to this kind of medical care. Um, I think that there's a lot of waste that's generated by denying, you know, some of these like relatively inexpensive treatments such as hormone therapy. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, uh, it, I think that people are kind of like trading on this issue for political capital um, instead of thinking about, you know, the long-term costs, like actual cost of denying people health care um, treatment when they need it. You know, if there's a lot of, there are a lot of cases that have shown um, or talk about inmates who were, you know, routinely denied treatment, hormone treatment, um, only to attempt, you know, self-castration um, and self-mutilation, and uh, which just racks up costs for the system down the road, because once that happens, then they finally have to, like, take it seriously as a medical problem, and um, I, I think being a little bit more proactive in that, uh, you know, kind of analyzing this um, would be, would do a lot of good. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I wanted to build off a little bit um, on one of the things I found interesting in Professor Telesh's um, talk this morning, um, or, or I guess earlier this afternoon, uh, kind of straddling the noon hour. Um, but he uh, had a, a, a quote from a doctor or a social worker, I can't I don't remember, but a medical professional um, talking about kind of the process of documenting medical necessity um, in the form of letters from doctors and trying to show, um, you know, uh, that, a, uh, that a particular form of care was appropriate. And that person said that they deliberately try not to include too much information in these letters uh, because they think that sort of anything, ab you know, above and beyond the very basic uh, statements that need to be made will kind of turn into an excuse to deny care on the part of the insurance companies um, and that really got me thinking because I feel like, you know, in some of the advocacy that we've been doing, uh, we're spending a lot of time trying to bring in uh, more information about the context, more information about who the client is as a person, why this care is so important to them, how it's going to change their life, etc. cetera. Um, and I, you know, it, it strikes me as a real double bind that then perhaps it's, you know, it, it, it you know, if we, for example, talk about, um, you know, a client's, uh, uh, you know, severe anxiety or their um, suicidal ideation or their inclination to self-harm or something like that, that somehow this will be then turned around and said, oh, well, we can't offer this care because this person's not psychiatrically stable or, you know, or something else. And I, I, I guess I wonder if anyone has thoughts about how, how we cope with that tension or, or what people should do about this kind of pressure to one, provide all this information but then on the other hand, you provide the information and then it's used to deny people care. Sorry, just uh, giving it a bit of thought. Um, you know, I think, I think that's been a, a particular issue. And, and I, uh, you know, for a lot of people who may not be familiar with this, there, there, there really is kind of an organized small group of, of um, kind of anti-trans reactionaries that, that organizes to get care um, to, to not be covered. Um, it's, it's really just a, I, I called it an Ouroboros of, of like three doctors that kind of promote a lot of this um, anti-trans medical literature. So, uh, Dr. Lippman at Brown University, Dr. Zucker and Dr. Levine. Um, and they all like, there was a, a study that came out today or not today, last week uh, for, by Dr. Lippman. She's the one coined with, uh, uh, credited with coining the kind of not real phenomenon of rapid onset gender dysphoria. And her study was published in a, in a journal edited by Dr. Zucker, who was like this noted like conversion therapist who worked in Toronto. 
And she heavily cited work by Dr. Stephen Levine, another conversion therapist who works out of uh, uh, Washington University. Um, and they just kind of, it's just a circle. But one of the main things that they keep pushing is that, you know, they're not adequately evaluating people for um, other psychiatric conditions. Um, if they have depression, if they have um, anxiety or these other things. And so what may end up happening is, is really this kind of gatekeeping around if you have comorbid um, conditions of denying the care saying, well, you, you're not able to make this decision because you have depression or severe depression. And it's like in nowhere else, you know, unless somebody is having, you know, severe issues where, where confidence is at stake or there's a serious question of their capacity to make medical judgments. I don't think there's really other areas where people are really questioned in this way or denied care um, because they have a comorbid um, uh, uh, mental illness. And I think it's, it's particularly heinous because a lot of these things um, are actually a result of gender dysphoria and also just the way that society treats trans people. So it's kind of this perverse thing where like trans people are discriminated against, they have adverse um, outcomes from, from in employment, housing, healthcare, and all these different areas and lack of support from family. And they develop trauma responses and depression, anxiety, PTSD, and all these things. And then it's even more perverse when it's just turned around and used against them to, to access care. Um, and it's really kind of been a, a targeted strategy by, by a lot of anti-trans folks. Um, and it's particularly terrible when, when insurance companies kind of adopt that kind of line as well. And, you know, going back to the point of like them wanting to see entire medical records, that, that's kind of um, uh, per, uh, particularly um, uh, just not great, uh, I guess is how I'll put it. And then, uh, you know, another area that, you know, just kind of tangentially related that this reminds me of, um, uh, I, I had a, a gender affirming surgery in, in March and prior to getting um, uh, the surgery, um, I had to go through routine blood tests and, and urinalysis and everything. And I, I didn't think anything of it. And then I get a call from the physician's assistant who um, was like, you know, you, you tested positive for amphetamines. And I'm like, why did you do a drug test? You know, I take Adderall prescribed daily as part of my ADHD diagnosis. Um, and I was like, but what? I wasn't informed or give it, I didn't give any consent for a drug test. Um, and then it turned out that Mount Sinai was doing um, blanket urinalysis uh, talk screens um, for all of their trans patients at Mount Sinai, uh, which is incredibly problematic. Um, unfortunately, I, I said I, I had started the legal clinic there and I was very familiar with the leadership of the, the clinic. And I immediately brought up, this is a, a red flag because I was immediately concerned, like this was not something I'd had when I've had surgeries for other things or in other locations, I've never had a talk screen done. Um, and it was just particularly galling. And so like, you know, I can imagine like things like prior drug abuse or, or um, addiction being used to, to deny surgeries. I mean, in this case, like, you know, I, I felt like I was being interrogated about like any potential substance abuse, you know, when I had a prescribed medication and, um, it just, it, it's particularly, you know, and, and the way that these biases and these institutional biases and prejudices just kind of work their way into the system. Um, it's just, it's, it's kind of jarring when I encounter it. It's just like, you know, I, I don't think they were intending to like necessarily target trans people, but it would just became a policy like, and people just kind of don't think about it, you know, they defer to, oh, it was the anesthesiologists that were requiring this. Okay, well, why were they requiring this? Were they requiring this of all their patients or just the trans patients? Um, and so they immediately removed that policy, you know, within like two weeks of me bringing it up. But I think it, it speaks to a broader issue that like, you know, th there's just this kind of insidious way that societal biases and prejudices work their way into the medical system. Um, and it's not just, you know, like outright, you know, facial discrimination, it can just be these really subtle ways. Thank you. I think that's incredibly powerful and so important. Um, and I guess it strikes me that, you know, this, this is one of the things we have to struggle with as much as um, 
uh, you know, um, medical experts can be uh, a great resource to try and break down some of the incredible bias and prejudice and uh, hostility uh, that exists in the culture against uh, trans and gender non-conforming people. Uh, the medical system does can do so much violence and um, and and can perpetuate you know so many of the biases that we're trying to eliminate. And I, I thank you for just pointing out, you know, how incessant these things can be and invisible, um, you know, it's a sort of uh, death by a thousand cuts in that way. Um, and that's a really powerful point. Um, well, I think we're gonna close there because it's 1.45. I would just really like to thank all of our panelists, um, particularly Professor Talesh and um, Professor Carabolo for joining us today. Um, sorry, sorry, it's uh, uh, Carabio. Carbio, I'm so sorry, okay. uh, Professor Carbio. I really uh, appreciate you coming and uh, joining us and sharing your wisdom and expertise. Thank you to Sophia and Walker also. Um, uh, this has been a, a really terrific, um, terrific event. And, and thank you uh, to everyone who came and, and who joined us today. Uh, Professor Pasquale, I don't know if you have anything you want to add. Oh, no, I just want to add my own thanks. It's just been, I think, such an illuminating program and really, again, makes me so proud of the uh, uh, clinical work and other programs we're doing here. And um, thank you. Bye.